A good personal finance toolkit needs to serve three essential objectives. One, wealth generation through investment products. Two, retirement accumulation via pension plans. And thirdly, protection, which is best served with insurance policies. Now, this might come as a surprise, but most of us are already invested in one such financial product which addresses all three needs, that is wealth, retirement, and protection. And this multi-dextrous product is none other than the Employee Provident Fund or EPF as it is commonly called. Hi everyone, my name is Shankar Nath and in this video, we shall present the complete guide to EPF. We'll cover all essential areas, including the design of the product, how EPF works, interest earned, what are the withdrawal rules, and some specific scenario whose knowledge will help you extract more from your compensation package. Having said this, this video has been created not just for salaried employees, but you'll find this content a big help if you are an entrepreneur or work in the HR department of a company, or if you are a manager who's trying to help out a confused junior with his or her CTC breakup. और हाँ, अगर आप इस वीडियो को हिंदी में समझना प्रेफर करते हैं, तो सीसी बटन दबा के हिंदी सबटाइटल्स को जरूर ऑन करें। Let's begin. The EPF is not one scheme, but actually comprises three different schemes with three different objectives. The first part or the core of the scheme is the EPF part, which is where your retirement benefits are accumulated. This is the wealth generation part of the scheme and a large part of this video will be focused on this. The second part of EPF is EPS or the Employee Pension Scheme. The purpose of the EPS is to generate pension for employees after the age of 58 years. And the third and final part of EPF is the Employee Deposit Linked Insurance Scheme or EDLI which is a life insurance cover provided to the member. So very simply, EPF consists of three parts, the EPF, the EPS, and the EDLI. It's good to note here that one does not need to register separately for all these three benefits. This means when you get registered to EPF, you're automatically registered for EPS and EDLI as well. On the face of it, the workings of the EPF scheme are quite straightforward. It starts with the employee paying a certain part of his or her salary towards the scheme, which is often matched with an equal contribution from the employer. And then this combined money is taken and deposited with the Employee Provident Fund Organization or EPFO on which you continue to accumulate interest every year. And that's it. This is the basic workings of an EPF scheme and generally how the HR team might explain it to you when listing the components of your CTC during a salary negotiation. However, the devil is in the details. So let's look a little deeper into it. Let's start with the word salary. For the purpose of EPF, salary means only two things. That is your basic salary and your DNS allowance which means it does not include your HRA, conveyance allowance, special allowance, or any other benefit given in your salary slip. Now, generally, companies in the private sector don't have a dearness allowance component, so it's only basic salary that becomes the basis of the EPF calculations. The next part to understand is the eligibility under the scheme. The present rules require that any organization with 20 or more employees will have to compulsorily register with the EPFO and provide employees with EPF benefits. In fact, organizations with less than 20 employees can also join the EPF program on a voluntary basis. Additionally, the rules also state that employees whose salary is up to 15,000 rupees a month have to necessarily be a part of the EPF program. Now this begs us to ask the question, is it possible to opt out of the EPF program altogether? And the answer to this is yes. One can opt out of the EPF scheme when you start your career. That is, at the time, you join your first company at a basic salary of more than 15,000 rupees a month. In that case, since you have never contributed to an EPF scheme, 
you can fill form 11 while joining the organization which will then treat you as an excluded employee for PF purposes. Of course, you can join the EPF program later, but once you are enrolled under the scheme, you cannot be exempted from it unless you join a company in the future or a startup that is not registered under the EPF Act. Having said this, in our view, most organizations that come under the ambit of EPF make it compulsory for employees to join the scheme and that's the scenario we will work with. So here's a very common scenario on how EPF works. The employee's deduction towards EPF comes to 12% of his or her basic salary. And this number is equally matched by the employer. So that's another 12%. 12 plus 12 comes to 24%. However, this entire 24% does not go towards your EPF accumulation. So here's what happens. The 12% that is contributed by the employee goes into the EPF, so no complication there. But it's the employer's 12% that gets split into two parts. The first part, that is 3.67%, goes to the EPF as expected. But the larger chunk, the second part of the employer's contribution, that is 8.33%, goes to the Employee Pension Scheme or EPS. This means while 24% is being apportioned from your CTC, only 15.67% is going towards your Wealth Accumulation Corpus, while the remaining 8.33% is going to the pension corpus. At this time, I like to address with an actual example which will serve two purposes. One, it will make things clearer. And secondly, it will help us address a small complication. So let's say your salary, that is basic plus DA, is 50,000 rupees a month. So step one is the employee contribution to EPF, which is simply 12% of 50,000 that comes to 6,000 rupees. Step two is the employer contribution part, which can be broken into two subparts. Step 2A is the 3.67%, which goes to EPF. So 3.67% of 50,000 comes to 1,835 rupees. Step 2B is where that extra complication is because it's not a straightforward 8.33% of 50,000 here. And that's because for the purpose of calculating the EPS contribution, the rules require that the salary itself should be capped at 15,000 rupees. This means instead of 8.33% of 50,000, we should calculate 8.33% of 15,000 as the employer's contribution towards EPS. This comes to 1,250 rupees. So what happens to the rest? That is 8.33% of 35,000 rupees. Well, that amount, which comes to 2,915 rupees, will be added to the employer's contribution towards EPF. So to put it all together, the total employer's contribution towards EPF comes to 3.67% of 50,000, that's 1,835 rupees, plus 8.33% of 35,000, that's 2,915 rupees, which totals to 4,750 rupees. Net net, 24% of 50,000, which comes to 12,000 rupees, is split as 10,750 rupees into EPF and 1,250 rupees into EPS in this particular case. Now, the reason why this entire splitting and contributions are important is because they help you understand your salary structure better. Firstly, as an employee, you now know some additional parts of your CTC breakup with the employee and employer's contribution to Provident Fund. An understanding of this can impact your take-home salary. For example, if your organization allows it, you can opt for the minimum mandatory PF contribution of 1,800 rupees, that's 12% of 15,000 rupees. This way you can increase your take-home salary by having your HR department rework on the other components of your compensation. Secondly, if you are a business owner, then you can play it really smart by designing a salary structure where 100% of your salary is basic pay. 
This way you can push more contributions towards EPF which can reduce your tax outgo and create a good retirement nest for you in an instrument which gives tax-free returns. This is something that many HNIs and businessmen do and if you are keen to replicate this practice, do consult your chartered accountant for more details on the same. But having said this, don't forget to watch later sections of this video where we shall examine this very point in light of recent budget proposals. The EPF interest rate is proposed on an yearly basis by the Employees Provident Fund Organization's Central Board of Trustees, which is then sent for final approval to the Ministry of Finance. Interestingly, the interest rate was quite low in the 1950s and 1960s and never touched 6%. That was quite a stark comparison to the 1990s when the PF interest rates were a generous 12% before these started to gradually reduce over the next two decades. The last declared EPF interest rate was for the year 2019-20 which stood at 8.5%. This 8.5% is very interesting because this is probably the largest gap we are seeing when compared to the public provident fund which is at just 7.1%. So if the PPF is an indicator, it won't be surprising to see the EPF interest rates to temper a little or a lot lower in the coming financial year. And the reason for saying that is the EPF charter itself that requires that 85% of the EPF corpus needs to go into debt instruments which are currently yielding somewhere close to 5.8%. So this interest rate is something that needs to be watched out for. Also, a commonly asked question is with regards to whether interest shall be payable if no contributions are received in an account for more than 36 months. Now, there's a small story behind this. In the financial year 2011-12, the EPFO decided to stop paying interest on accounts that had been inoperative for more than three years, that's 36 months. This was done to discourage provident fund subscribers from neglecting their EPF accounts. This was met with a lot of resistance from all quarters and was eventually rolled back from November 2016. Which means now, even if your account is lying dormant for more than three years, it will continue to earn interest like it did earlier, until the member attains the age of 58 years. This continuity and a generous interest rate makes EPF an excellent retirement tool. On top of it, EPF taxation comes under the exempt, exempt, exempt category, which means the maturity amount will not attract any capital gains. There are three scenarios upon which 100% of the EPF can be withdrawn. One, upon attaining the age of 58 years. Two, if you are unemployed for two months or more. And thirdly, upon the premature death of the member, upon which the entire corpus is given to the appointed nominee. Now, if you want to withdraw from your EPF account before retirement, then there are quite a number of terms and conditions that you need to be mindful of. The first such condition pertains to the scenarios under which you are allowed to make a premature withdrawal. And these include very specific scenarios like education, purchase of land, marriage, medical emergency, home loan repayment, etc. A more comprehensive list of scenarios is available in the EPF India website. We'll have a link to that in the description of this video. Let's take a couple of scenarios to illustrate the complexity involved. So let's say one wants to withdraw for medical reasons. In this case, the member is allowed to withdraw the employee's accumulated corpus or six times the monthly salary, whichever is lower. Let's take another scenario, say withdrawal for a wedding. In this case, the member must have completed at least seven years of service and upon which 50% of the employee's contribution with interest can be withdrawn. So different purposes have different rules, so one has to be mindful of that. There were two proposals raised in the 2021 budget which has an impact on EPF. The first proposal was to disallow any deduction on account of the employee's PF contribution as an expense to the employers if the employer does not deposit the EPF contributions within the stipulated time. 
This has been done to put pressure on employers to deposit the contributions on time so that employees don't suffer from loss of interest on account of the employer's laxity. An additional objective of doing this is to ensure that the employers do not misuse or divert this money for any other purpose. The second proposal in the budget is aimed at the high salary bracket users that says that any interest earned on annual provident fund contributions exceeding rupees 2.5 lakhs shall be taxable from 1st of April 2021. It's important to note here that this provision will only apply to the employee's contribution and not that of the employer. To put this into perspective, we did a quick back of the envelope calculation. A 2.5 lakh annual threshold means a person contributing up to 20,833 rupees a month to EPF. This at a 12% employee contribution comes to a monthly basic salary of 1.73 lakhs. So if your basic salary is less than 1.73 lakhs, you really don't have to worry about this. But don't just go with our understanding. It's better to figure this out from your tax advisor who will have a more rounded understanding of this particular provision. The EPF or Employee Provident Fund is not the only retirement nest creation option. It competes with PPF, NPS, fixed deposits, mutual funds, and a few more instruments for the consumer's attention and money. So why EPF? In addition to being one of the best retirement planning tools, EPF offers excellent interest rates, is exempt, exempt, exempt in terms of taxation, is a low risk instrument due to the government backing, offers pension, and is a very convenient saving tool. After all, you don't have to do much, right? You fill up some forms and your HR or payroll department takes care of everything else. In other words, one can think of EPF as a debt mutual fund SIP, but with a lot lower risk and without having to pay any capital gain tax. Net-net, if managed well, the EPF can go a long way in ensuring that you have a reasonably good retirement kitty. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I hope you liked this video and will draw many learnings from the information presented. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share this video with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.